My name is Andrew Allen. I'm the CEO and one of the founders of Gritstone Oncology, a company that also arose from a collaboration, uh, in our case, with Memorial Sloan Kettering. And two of our early founders, Tim Chan and Naya Rizvi, did some of the pioneering work that enabled us to uh, speak with you today about the topic of neoantigens. If you like, Dr. June's uh, excellent talk this morning reflected an effector-based approach to treating cancer. We're looking at it from the other perspective, from the target's side. I'll be making some forward-looking statements, and I'm going to be focusing on the notion of tumor antigens today. And as you know, tumor antigens are central to cancer immunotherapy. They are, of course, the targets of T-cell attack, and T-cells, unlike B cells and antibodies recognize not intact surface proteins, whole proteins, but instead T cells recognize short peptide fragments presented by platform molecules uh, called HLA molecules, which are highly polymorphic. Sorry, could we go back one, please? I don't think I hit that. Thanks. Uh, there are various degrees of target specificity. And this is an important area of, of research now, and this is really the basis for the foundation of Gritstone Oncology, that there appear to be some exquisitely tumor-specific targets, uh, exquisitely selective and unique to the tumor, which of course may provide perfect targets for immune attack. Uh, neoantigens are perhaps the best example of this type of target. These are mutated fragments derived from altered genes, uh, which, of course, because of their mutated status, are relatively uh, specific to the tumor. There's some interesting new data that neoantigens may be found outside of tumors, but if they don't have uh, reproductive fitness, then they'll be found just on one or two cells as opposed to across a population of cells. And so neoantigens may comprise great targets for us to focus the immune system upon uh, and seek to destroy, in particular, solid tumors, which have proven rather difficult to uh, many forms of current immunotherapy. The challenge with uh, neoantigens is that they're quite rare. And the evidence suggests that about 1% of all tumor mutations uh, will create a true functional neoantigen. So I just want to pause on that point. Some folks confuse mutation as a synonym for neoantigen, and they are absolutely not the same thing. A mutation, obviously, uh, is an alteration in the DNA from the uh, germline sequence. Many mutations alter the subsequent amino acid, so those would be uh, non-synonymous mutations. Uh, and a subset of those, as I say, around 1%, uh, are expected to create peptides which can be processed and presented by the tumor cell on the cell surface. Other uh, antigens can play a similar role, uh, such as cancer testis antigens, but these are self-proteins and they do not carry the feature of foreignness, which is very important from an immunologic perspective. Now, checkpoint inhibitors, of course, have transformed the way we think about solid tumor immunotherapy, but a persistent finding, here exemplified by some early data from Tony Rebus's group at UCLA, is that patients who have large numbers of pre-existing tumor infiltrating CD8 T cells are the patients who are likely to respond well to checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy. Uh, and on the left here, you can see the patients with large numbers of tumor infiltrating CD8 T cells. These are melanoma patients being treated with Pembro. Uh, and those patients have a good probability of response to Pembro monotherapy. But on the right are the patients who don't have those large numbers of T cells. And the question becomes, how can we help those patients? Well, we now know that many of the T cells infiltrating tumors are specific to neoantigens within the tumor. And Steve Rosenberg has done a lot of pioneering work to demonstrate that principle. And so the simple therapeutic hypothesis exists. If we can help patients uh, generate de novo T cell responses against their tumor neoantigens, we may be able to augment the efficacy of checkpoint inhibitors. So to accomplish that, we need to do two simple things, exemplified here on a two by two. So first of all, we need to accurately identify neoantigens from within the ocean of mutations. And then we need to elicit large numbers of neoantigen-specific T cells. And it's important to remember, at some level, immunotherapy is a numbers game. You need enough of the right types of T cells in order to see clinical benefit. So it's not enough just to elicit a modest T cell response. You need a sizable, probably CD8, uh, polyfunctional T cell response to observe efficacy. So on that first dimension, 
prediction. This is a challenging problem, and the problem is exemplified in the cartoon on the left. Many mutations and only a subset will make it to the surface of the tumor cell as a presented neoantigen. The field started using a tool called NetMHC, which focuses upon predictions of peptide HLA binding as a way of determining from within the many mutations which might be neoantigens. And that is an excellent tool developed by the Danes to, uh, to predict HLA peptide binding, but it ignores a lot of the biology of protein processing and ultimate peptide presentation. And so it's unfit for purpose here with very low positive predictive value as shown on the right. And so what we did uh, was to, to take an, a technique developed in the 90s by Don Hunt and Vic Engelhardt called immunopeptidomics, where you isolate HLA presented peptides off a tumor cell surface and sequence them by mass spectrometry. And with newer techniques, when you run that analysis on a uh, fresh or fresh frozen tumor specimen, you'll often get somewhere between three to 10,000 peptide species per sample. Uh, and by doing that analysis on hundreds of human tumor specimens, we were able to generate a training data set of human tumor HLA presented peptides, numbering in excess of 1 million peptides, and then train a machine learning model to be able to use simple DNA and RNA genomic features and predict with much better accuracy which of the mutations would be presented on the cell surface as a neoantigen. And on the right, you can see using held out samples that we're delivering uh, nearly a 10x improvement over the public tools in terms of predictive accuracy. But a better test is when we uh, looked at some Rosenberg data of real neoantigens from patients with melanoma. And so we aggregated data from about four manuscripts. Uh, one of these came from the Dutch NKI and Ton Schumacher's group, where they characterized neoantigens robustly using a totally orthogonal T-cell screening approach in vitro, looking for T-cell reactivity against all of the possible mutations uh, within a patient's tumor. So this is a very robust way of identifying neoantigens. And we asked ourselves the question, if we were trying to make a neoantigen therapeutic, a vaccine for these patients, using just DNA information, would we have predicted accurately the neoantigens which were subsequently observed to be truly present within those tumors? And so using a model 10 neoantigen vaccine notion, we analyzed the DNA data from the, these uh, patients and asked whether our predicted neoantigens would be the legitimate ones. And in the figure on the right, you can see the results of this analysis. So uh, you can see on the bottom are the 12 patients that, that Rosenberg identified neoantigens in. Um, and then we asked the question, if we made a 10 neoantigen product for each of these patients, would we have correctly included any of the observed truth of neoantigens? And you can see the, uh, the, the tool that we developed is shown in blue, and that's the edge tool, and the public tool is shown in orange. And you can see that we're predicting on average around two neoantigens for 11 of the 12 patients versus the public tool's performance, which is clearly uh, inferior in orange. Again, not because it's a bad tool, it's just not a tool that was developed for this job. So uh, prediction seems to be something we can now do with adequate accuracy. Next slide, please. Now we need to immunize patients. Let's go to the next slide. And the question becomes, how can we generate large numbers of neoantigen-specific T cells in humans? Uh, and as Dr. June observed, infectious disease can teach us a lot about cancer immunotherapy. And so here we've taken some tricks from the infectious disease literature uh, where groups around the world focused upon malaria, Ebola, and HIV have converged upon a couple of tricks to try and drive strong CD8-specific uh, T cell responses. Uh, the first trick is that you put your antigens of interest into a viral vector. Perhaps not surprisingly, delivering antigens of interest within a viral vector system is a highly efficient way of eliciting a strong immune response, and particularly a T cell response. And secondly, you prime with one vector, but you cannot give repeat doses because you'll get humoral immunity to that first vector. Uh, in our case, we use an adenovirus, and so you have to switch to a different vector system. And this is termed the heterologous prime boost. It appears to be the best-in-class way of generating large numbers uh, of antigen-specific T cells, which are sustained over time. And that's believed to be an important attribute for effective cancer immunotherapy. This, the uh, 
the work done around the world really has shown that the most effective priming vector is the adenovirus. And we and others use a chimpanzee adenovirus because it induces uh, very strong T cell responses, dominated by CD8, although including CD4. So the first dose of vector is given with our neoantigens of interest inside the chimpanzee adenovirus. And then we boost with a self-amplifying RNA that contains the same set of neoantigens wrapped within a lipid nanoparticle uh, for delivery purposes. So this is the heterologous prime boost. We give the vector on day zero, and we give monthly doses in humans of the uh, self-amplifying RNA vector system. Next slide, please. In primates, we've tested this uh, experimental system using a set of six SIV antigens, so simian immunodeficiency virus antigens. And here, we're uh, treating uh, groups of about six monkeys per group with the full priming and boosting vector system together with systemic ipilimumab, which is known to augment antigen-specific T-cell responses. And we're counting the T-cell responses using a standard overnight L-spot assay. And you can see here that we're generating between five to 10,000 antigen-specific spots uh, per 10 to the 6 PBMCs, which is a very, very substantial T-cell response. Typically, uh, with LE spots with lesser potency systems, you'll see somewhere between 0 to 100 uh, on the y-axis. And clearly, we're 1 to 2 logs above that here. Now, this is primate data. Will we see the same in humans? Next slide, please. And the data from the uh, infectious disease literature suggests that we should. Here are J&J data using their adenovirus-based uh, HIV vaccine system, uh, where they did exact comparisons of rhesus macaques, the species we've used, and humans in blue and orange. Uh, and you can see that the T cell responses are essentially similar in magnitude. Next slide, please. The key question is, how many T cells do I need? And it's a little hard to answer that. But the best attempt we've made so far, and we've just entered the clinic, so we will have clinical data shortly, uh, is that if you look at T cell data from patients responding to adoptive cell therapy, you can start to get some sense of the number of antigen-specific T cells in the blood associated with clinical response. And so here we've got uh, Rosenberg's HPV-specific TIL therapy on the left. We've got um, Kite CD19 car in the middle and MYESO1 TCR therapy on the right. And you can see that we're able to deliver a similar magnitude of T cells in a primate system as observed in these humans responding to cell therapy. So this is very much apples and pears, but at least gives us some basis for optimism as we enter the clinic. And so I'll finish in the last couple of slides and the development programs. Next slide, please. Next slide. We have two platforms. One is a specific to each patient neoantigen program where we take each patient's tumor, sequence it, identify candidate neoantigens, and put them into the therapeutic product. And the other is an off-the-shelf product called the SLATE program where we use shared neoantigens, which is the notion that certain patients will actually have common driver mutations and a relevant HLA which can, is known to be able to present those uh, driver mutations. And I think with that, we're out of time, so I'll wrap up. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thanks.